Hello and welcome to the Science Fiction and Fantasy Marketing Podcast, the show where we help you establish your author brand, increase the size of your audience, and sell more books. I'm Lindsay Baroker, and I'm here with my two co-hosts. I'm Jeff Poole. And I'm Joe Lalo. And we've got a cool guest for you this week, Chris Philbrook. We're going to be talking about launching a new pen name, getting an audiobook deal with Audible. And it's all, he's done a lot of stuff with uh, sci-fi, fantasy, and horror. So we're going to kind of cover it all there and find out what he's doing to find some success. Uh, Chris, as I said, is a prolific sci-fi, fantasy, and horror author, the owner of Tier One Games, LLC, a game development company. And uh, he's been writing and publishing for a while, but he's recently started a pen name for YA and... Uh, I believe, Chris, did you sell the audio book rights to that new release? I did. One? Yeah, I'm pretty excited about that. I actually I have a pretty lengthy history with working with Audible, and I'm pretty excited that they, they took a risk and picked up the, the pen name stuff. So. Awesome. Well, we're going to ask you how you got involved with them. And uh, I should say, when Chris is not working, he's sharing his new Hampshire, Hampshire <laughs> home with his wife, daughters, and dog, where his hobbies include being an avid reader, role player, miniatures game player, video game player, painter, and procrastinator. I had to get the full intro in there. I don't want to disappoint anybody with uh, <laughs> my ability, inability to pronounce New Hampshire. Disappointment is my job today. So. You can tell I'm a West Coast person. I, I don't even know where. New Hampshire, somewhere east, right? <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, why don't, sorry, why don't you tell us how you got into writing and publishing? Uh, well, I started out in game development. I backed into a job uh, working with WizKids, which is a miniatures game company. <clears throat> and uh, I was working as a play tester, and then I worked on one of the product lines. And they needed some fiction blurbs written for uh, their website. And uh, they put out the call to you know, 20, 30 people one day, and I wrote four or five little pieces. Uh, based on the games we were working on, and they decided to put up all of them, which was pretty cool. And uh, from there, they started to ask me to write more, and I started creating content for the rule books and uh, supplement scenarios, that kind of stuff. And uh, I got laid off when the company was bought out, and uh, fast-forwarded a few years and had the writing itch and felt like I could actually make a run at doing something pretty robust. And I went back to school, and picked up a third shift job. And I was a, a mental health counselor at a school. And uh, basically I, I had all night to write. <clears throat> and as long as I was you know, present and accounted for and able to help the kids if they had a crisis, I was free to write. So I had a, you know, an idea for a book just stating that my friend had dared me to write when we were in high school. And I said, you know what, I'm gonna do it. And started writing and started publishing it online. Just for fun, I wasn't planning on trying to get it published. It was more just a, sort of an exercise in, you know, can I do this? And uh, caught the attention of John Ringo, a uh, pretty big science fiction guy. And John reached out and said, what are you doing with this? And I said, I have no idea what I'm doing. Uh, and uh, fast forward a year or so and had some books put together and published and built up a pretty big fan base through my website. And now I'm a full-time writer. So. A lot of did luck. You, <laughs> did you jump straight to self-publishing or did you go traditional first? I was in negotiations uh, with Bain Publishing for about a year and a half. We were formatting it, getting it going. We were at the contract stage um, discussing dollar figures and then they backed out. Um, and I had a big enough following on the website that was screaming for books that said, you know, you don't need a publishing deal. Just, you know, put a couple of the books out independently and see what happens. Um, so... I did. I put out the first uh, three independently, and they were immediate successes. Uh, this is in the horror genre. And uh, by the fourth or fifth book in the series was out, it's an eight-book series, uh, by the time the fourth or fifth book was out, I was able to quit my job and just start writing. So, knock on wood. That's awesome. What, what year was this? Because it sounds like something that worked 10 years ago or more, okay. and then... You know, you don't see so many people now doing the web first and then jumping yeah. into it. What were you early on, or was this more uh, recent? The website went live in 2010, middle of 2010, and I wrote consistently on the line until the end of or, yeah, about, about the middle of 2012, uh, and then started publishing in I think 2014. Um, so about five years ago, I would say, uh, was when I, I jumped from. Um, 
the you know the website to trying to have actual you know physical books and ebooks and then a year or so after that i started getting into audio uh, at first with acx so and audio has been gigantic for me <clears throat> Oh, that's awesome. And I'm, I'm curious because it, it always seems like it's super hard to attract readers when you're nobody to a website that is for nobody, uh, as opposed to, you know, it's easier if you have stuff on Amazon because people are searching there. What did you do to, do you even know, did you start writing or were you a part of communities or anything that kind of drew in some folks? Uh, I would say pretty comfortably uh, myself and my small circle of friends were banned from about 300 groups on Facebook. Uh, and I couldn't even tell you how many forums for just trying to share the word that the website you know, existed. Um, it started, uh, my website started right around the time that the Walking Dead show started to take off. And it's, it's a zombie story. And we kind of caught that tidal wave. And we're able to sort of hook in at the beginning of the um, show's audience and sort of build that way. Uh, a lot of Facebook at that time, uh, back before they adjusted the algorithms and really started to make you pay for everything. Um, so, you know, a post in 2010, 2011 uh, gave you significantly more reach uh, for free than it does now. Uh, so I, I was able to capitalize on that. Now, in order to do the same thing, you'd have to pay hundreds of dollars to reach the same amount of people. Uh, but yeah, just a lot of posting on forums and, and you know, word of mouth, which is really big. So. So if you're willing to get yourself banned from uh, numerous platforms, <laughs> it's possibly an option. Exactly, yeah. Well, it looks I, like you've done uh, the zombies and dragons and kind of a far future sci-fi. So yeah. quite a few of the subgenres. What would you say has worked best for you? And have you uh, had any challenges because you're kind of jumping around to different stuff? Um, I, you know, I think I have creative ADHD. Uh, I have to try and do new stuff constantly because my brain gets bored. Um, I would say, you know, financially the horror stuff, the post-apocalyptic stuff has been the most lucrative. Uh, I enjoy the, um, urban fantasy stuff, the dragon series, the reemergence. I enjoy writing that a lot. Uh, and then, you know, my baby, my pet project is the dark fantasy trilogy, uh, the kinless trilogy, which is probably the most favorite thing I've ever written, but it's been the least successful. Um, which is very frustrating because, you know, you pour your heart and soul into a project and then, you know, it just kind of goes into a casket <laughs> and, uh, you know, people send you flowers every once in a while and talk about that thing you tried to do. Uh, but yeah, it's the, you know, financially it's been the post-apocalyptic stuff. I'm really excited for YA because I think I have a good voice for it and I have a good story, I think. So hopefully it'll, it'll pan out. Cool. Um, I, your your intro mentions that you are a prolific, and you have uh, a lot of different genres that you're in. So I'm sort of curious what your release schedule is like. Like, how often do you get a book out? Uh, right now, it's very erratic. Um, we have two little kids in the house. Uh, my wife and I have an almost three year old and an almost one year old, and we made the decision that we wanted to work from home, uh, so we didn't have to pay for daycare and were able to raise our daughters. Um, rather than send them out. So since we had the kids, my release um, tempo has dropped off pretty dramatically, which means earnings have dropped off, but you know, that's a decision we made. Uh, right now, I would say I'm releasing about every four months. Um, and then it, it varies. Sometimes I have a, a bunch of novella projects that I do and the novellas I can knock out in a month. Um, and sometimes I'll put out, you know, two or three of those in a year instead of you know one of those novels so you know in terms of releases i might show that i released seven or eight titles in a year but really it's only like two or three novels and then five or six small projects you and i are similar in that regard uh, <laughs> uh i should ask too uh when you are releasing uh, uh stuff do you focus on a genre for multiple releases or do you just do whatever it depends on contracts um uh Audible, again, bought the rights to three of the books in the Reemergence series and had a, um, a pretty, pretty strict release schedule that they wanted me to adhere to. So as soon as I signed that paperwork, I was like, all right, guys, looks like we're writing these books right now. Uh, so I've essentially just written three of those in a row, uh, which makes my creative ADHD you know, have a little palpitation. Uh, I'm very excited to wrap the, the fifth book in the series, which is the last one that I'm contracted for because I have other projects that I really need to get back to. 
So my question for you is, does the performance of a series dictate which genre or is a series you want to write in next? Or do you have a set schedule on which titles will be released for the year? Or how, how, do you, how, do you, how do you have it worked out? Uh, again, it goes by contracts and I have to satisfy, you know, what I've agreed to. But beyond that, um, it's kind of like gauging how long I can keep um, my fans' interest. Uh, and get them excited and build and build their impatience for the next book. Um, I rapid released two books in the horror series last year within a few months of each other, and then they're going to have to wait, you know, six, eight months for the next one. And the idea being is I put two out, built a lot of hype, let them spread the word of mouth, let them, you know, do some of the marketing on their end, um, which my fans are fantastic. I have terrific fans. Uh, and then by the time, you know, their interest is at a peak and they start feeling impatient, the next book should be ready. Um, and sort of following that cycle through uh, has been pretty successful for me. All right. And if you didn't have contracts to obligations to worry about, what would your schedule look like? I'd rotate. Um, in a perfect world, I would rotate through my series. Uh, you know, I would do a, a modern fantasy book first, um, and then a horror book, and then one of the science fiction books. Uh, <clears throat> and then I usually have one title a year that I would describe as being entirely speculative, you know, a, a one-off novel that I'd like to write that I could just set the, side, set the time aside for, or, you know, the book one of a potential new series that I really want to try to see what happens. Um, it's been harder to do that since we've cut back on the amount of time we work because I just don't make enough money to not invest my time in something that doesn't have some sort of a guaranteed sale um, because, you know, I have bills to pay, I got kids to feed, so. If I want to do this writing gig, I have to kind of be a professional about it. I can't just start throwing darts and see what happens. Yeah, it, it, it's kind of like uh, once you decide this is your full-time job, you don't have quite as much leeway or you, you have to maybe write a couple for the fans you know are going to sell. Yeah, and then exactly. you can try something new and always hope that that will take off too. Yeah, exactly. Well, we've been kind of teasing folks about the audiobooks. Uh, you mentioned getting hooked up with Audible. And for those yeah. who don't know, uh, there's a few public audiobook publishers that will pick up indie authors, like uh, Podium's out there, um, well, Tantor does. But I, I feel like Audible is the one where I've heard people make the most money from. <laughs> it's just, or maybe I've just happened to run into a few people that have got a really good deals from them and doing really well. But it makes sense since they can promote stuff on audible and amazon whereas the other ones are publishers hoping you know right. could you well, tell us a little to, bit yeah about it yeah the tantor brilliance uh, podium they all have to pay audible to advertise um so you know if you can sign with audible studios or or do something really special through acx then you know you're already at the source of the core of the advertising um, so i think they can pay more because they don't have to invest more theoretically and did you try to pitch them or did they come find you? Uh, I had an agent for a few years, a literary agent, um, and he had contacts inside Audible. And the, uh, the horror series that I wrote, uh, Adrian the Dead Diary, uh, through ACX, which I independently produced, um, had some pretty stellar audio success. Um, so when he went to Audible and he said, hey guys, you know, we've got this guy's writing more books. He's got some stuff for sale. Take a look at your ACX numbers. You already have all the, all the data for, you know, what, what he's doing over there and, you know, chart the trajectory, see if you want to put some marketing money behind it. And, uh, almost immediately they said, yep, we want to look at the next stuff. Um, and I, I got kind of lucky too, because Tantor offered on them at the same time. Um, so we were able to kind of leverage the two against each other and squeeze a little bit more money out of them, which was, incredibly fortunate uh, but now it's it's uh, audible has rights of first refusal on my audio stuff uh, which is a you know huge sigh of relief because for the most part I can be a little speculative and try something that you know I'm not sure of and they're probably going to give me at least a little something for it so whether or not it sells after that is you know anybody's guess but I at least you know know that I'll probably get you know some bread money Oh, that's great. And um, you said you found some success early on with the audiobooks. Did you do anything special to try to market those? Uh, no. Uh, the, the main thing I did was I uh, was very selective with getting a narrator. Um, I went through 40 or 50 auditions and really ran, uh, you know, the, the, the finalists through the, you know, the, the gauntlet to make sure that they were on board, made sure they had, you know, the, 
idea of what was going on. And, you know, I had a little bit of, um, you know, muscle in the moment because the, the e-books uh, and the print books were selling well. So the, they had a pretty reasonable idea that when it sold, it was going to be a, a reasonable success. Um, and I, I cast a phenomenal narrator, uh, James Anderson Foster, and he stuck through the whole series, through all eight books. And, you know, we have two more in the series, nine and ten now. And several of the books were nominated for Audis. Uh, so we got a little bit of like awards sort of recognition at one point. Um, and that just kind of, you know, fostered the success along. Um, as far as promoting the audio, it's really hard to promote audio right now. There aren't a lot of tools. Um, there aren't a lot of, you know, the, the email blasting websites like you, you have access to for ebooks. Uh, so kind of got to get inventive um, and really lean on um, Audible's sort of behind the scenes manipulation of what they think you'll like. So. Uh, I assume when you were when you were producing your own stuff that you were uh, paying up front as opposed to the profit share, right? Mixture of the two. Really? really depended on yeah, it depended on where I was financially at the time. Um, cool. So. Uh, all right. So uh, obviously, you know, you're you're with Audible now, so like that makes your decision about where your books are going to go. But uh, Find Away Voices uh, is starting to chip away at the near monopoly that ACX had. So if yep. things hadn't turned out the way they did, do you, do you see like value in and uh, uh, going wide with audio the way you might with with uh, with eBooks? Absolutely. Uh, I think Find Away Voices. Yeah, I'm, I'm only loosely familiar with them, but I think that they offer competition. Uh, which up until now there hasn't been any. So ACX hasn't really had any uh, impetus to sort of adjust to the market. Uh, they're able to just do whatever the hell they want to do, and authors and, and narrators and producers just sort of have to be like, okay, this is these are the tools we have. Uh, but with Find Away Voices coming in and having some what appears to be some pretty good success pretty fast, uh, it, it's nice that you know at least now ACX has to listen a little bit more, uh, offer a few more tools to people putting audio out independently so do you try to release your audiobooks for your titles as close as possible to the actual books or are you just release them whenever you know either audible gets time or you get time to do it ideally as uh synced up as possible uh if i can do same day based on the production schedule of the narrator um i, I try to do that uh, frequently there's a lag um, I'm able to push through, you know, eBooks and print books at, at a pace that, you know, sort of I can set, um, but the audio people, depending upon who gets the gig, uh, may or may not have a recording slot until, you know, a week, two weeks, three weeks after whatever, um, or sometimes much later than that. Uh, if I'm, you know, if having that narrator is extremely important for that project, you, you got to be a little flexible, um, and understand that these are people who are, you know, again, you know, self-employed, you know, producers of, of creative stuff. Um, and it's a partnership. So on average, how long does it take one of your audiobooks to get converted from start of the project to finish? It takes the typical narrator, um, two, two to three hours of studio time to record a book. Uh, most of my books come in at about 10 hours. So uh, call it 30 hours of production time. Um, and most narrators can really only produce about three to five hours a day. Um, so, you know, 30 hours, five hours a day. Um, and then there's the mastering and the editing proofing process at the end. And then I get the final thing and I have to go through it myself. So I have to listen to it and, you know, find any pronunciation errors that they missed or any recording glitches. Um, but from the moment they get the manuscript to the time I get the final uh, file back for approval, about a month give or take, assuming they go into production pretty quickly after they get it. That's nice that they give you back the files to listen to. I did not have that when I had a publisher and uh, I have listened to them and caught a few things. I'm like, oh man, that's a bummer that that's in the final. And um, when I do it through ACX, of course I can do that. I actually pay somebody to, <laughs> to do it for me, but uh, she catches everything. And <laughs> I actually got, I would say, more professional ones recently that I've done myself just because of that. Nobody's going to pay as much attention as you or, or someone close to you that you pay <laughs> to sure. uh, proof listen, I guess. Yeah. What's their level of investment? So uh, I'm curious if, uh, since you're kind of with them, unless they refuse, do you have to hold back your ebook and paperback releases at all so it all comes out together, or do they just yeah. plan to do it later? 
uh, Audible Studio is part of a, you know, the contract, the blanket contract that I have with them is to ensure um, simultaneous release on all formats. So frequently by the time they make an offer, I've already got the ebook and print book ready to go. Uh, and they need, you know, minimum six weeks to get everything up to snuff and to sort of build their marketing package, whatever they're going to do with it. So um, it, it's about a six week turnaround uh, with the, the phone, the YA project that I'm working on with them right now. Um, I'll have everything ready about three weeks before uh, they release the audio, which is perfect because that gives me plenty of time to make sure you know, nothing's going wrong. Yeah, it's definitely, oh, it is definitely ideal if you can release everything at once. I think yeah. I would have a hard time being patient for that, but at least yeah. six weeks isn't, isn't too bad. It's not like they're saying, okay, we'll have it in six months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the bigger the publishing house, the, the longer the lead, you know, so there's that to consider. Do you know if anybody is interested in working with them, do they need an agent or is it possible to pitch those guys? Audible Studios? Yeah. Um, you don't need an agent. Uh, it does help to know uh, people on the inside, obviously, which is what an agent does for you. Um, they are buying. They're definitely in a growth phase. They're looking for content. Um, they're looking for series content. They're not as interested in, in one shots from indies um, because indies tend to make their money on series, uh, and they do too. Uh, and they want the investment, you know, three or four books deep, you know. But yeah, it is possible to work with them. Um, I think they have information on their website on how to submit. Um, and the other option that you can do is, you know, go through ACX and then you know, before you accept any deals, see what your auditions look like. Uh, there's also this, the stipend uh, that ACX offers, which you now have to ask for. Uh, previously, they they hooked you up for it or hooked you up with it, you know, without asking. But now you have to push for it and get it. And if you you qualify for a stipend, then you're kind of already got a leg in the door for Audible Studios. So, all right, that's good to know for anybody who's a. Uh... You know, it's like, it's nice to control everything yourself, but at the same time, it's an expensive enough investment for a lot of folks that it's kind of nice to just have someone pay for <laughs> the narration <laughs> and just send me a check every quarter. Yeah, exactly. Um, so we're going to kind of swing into some marketing stuff, but uh, first I'm curious, you've, you've done all this other stuff under your regular name. What mm -hmm. made you decide to start a pen name for the YA series? Uh, I swear a lot. Uh, <laughs> just, just being honest, uh, most of my work, uh, the language is pretty unvarnished. Uh, intentionally, that's the style that I wanted when I, I, I set out to write. Uh, also, the, the audience that I was writing for, um, I, I knew language wasn't going to be an issue. Now that I'm trying to pivot away and try my hand uh, at a less uh, linguistically um, beaten up crowd, of you know young adults and, and late teens and whatnot. Uh, I think it's important to differentiate the brands. Uh, I would be worried that someone would buy uh, the YA book, The Phone, and then say, wow, that was really great. I'm gonna jump right into his next book and really get a shock, because uh, they are nothing alike. Um, other than like the same kind of sense of humors and like underlying themes and whatnot of the writing, the, the styles are, are pretty notably different, especially with language and sort of the violence um, and action. Um, so coming up with the pen name was a way for me to continue to uh, control uh, people's experiences. So when they, they buy all my books, they can search my name and find stuff that you know, is going to be in the same you know, backyard. Uh, and when someone new hopefully finds the YA stuff, they can search that name and find stuff that's, you know, a similar experience. And then if they really want to do some digging, they can find the connection uh, where, you know, my pen name is actually me and, you know, try, but they have to do a little bit of work. Uh, so there's a little bit of a barrier there, but that's intentional and that's actually what I want. Now, we've discussed this uh, a couple of times on the show, but I think it generally bears some further analysis. Uh, YA is a subset of genres that I think a lot of people trip over the criteria for. Uh, like you're talking a lot about content and language, and a lot of people would think, well, it doesn't have any adult content or adult language, so it must be YA, but lots of other people feel like there's a lot more specific criteria. So what defines a YA novel for you? Uh, for me, 
uh, chiefly uh, is the level of violence and adult language. Um, that's like sort of the defining you know, split between my existing stuff. Uh, also the themes. Uh, instead of, you know, sort of adult themes of, you know, midlife crises and dealing with adult level responsibilities, it's a little bit more uh, geared towards people who are just starting their lives. Where, do, where am I going instead of where do I go from here? Uh, basic ideas that are um, root intrinsic youthful uh, ideas. Uh, and going from there, it's, it's more positive than a lot of the stuff I've written. A lot of the, the more adult stuff uh, I've put out is pretty bleak. Um, lots of struggle, lots of darkness, and you know the YA stuff theoretically uh, is more about you know saving the world as opposed to just surviving it. Now, uh, w like one of the things that a lot of people require of YA to consider it YA is a uh, a protagonist that's not that much older than the intended audience. Like, where do you fall on the age of the protagonist thing? 16, uh, Yasmin in the story is 16. She, I think she turned 17 in the story. Uh, and that fit the, um, the, the basic idea of when she was born and how old she was when certain events happened. And I needed her to be old enough to sort of function on her own. Um, and a 13, 14 year old is a little too young. Uh, worldly enough, but not super worldly. So it's 16, 17 fit. All right, my question for you is, would you care to share any mistakes you've made during your writing career that you wish you could go back and fix? How long is the podcast? <laughs> uh, yeah, Lord, I couldn't even tell you how many mistakes I've made. Um, patience. Uh, I have been impatient about a lot of things. Uh, and I've paid that the, the price. I have um, accepted people's word on the quality of editors uh, and been burned. I think one of the biggest things you can do as an independent author or as an author in general is don't trust editors uh, and, and just, you know, vet them. Make sure you get a sample of their work. Uh, don't just, you know, hey, my buddy, this other author, you know, had a good experience with them. Well, great, but have them do a sample. Have them do 10,000 words and check to see if you like the way they edit. Uh, marketing money, I couldn't even tell you how much money I've thrown into the bottomless pit of marketing, uh, different email services, different ads, buying banners on websites. Um, I have tried just about everything uh, and have a lot of zeros to show for a lot of it. What about finding an artist that speaks the same language as you and understands you? So when you give them comments about what you want for your illustration, they don't go, huh? Yeah, I'm, I'm blessed. I, the guy who does the vast majority of my artwork is somebody that I went to high school with. Uh, and he and I have been very close friends since we were 12 or 13. Uh, we speak the same language. When I describe something to him in pretty vague terms, he knows me well enough that he's like, oh, do you mean this? Uh, yeah, actually, I do mean that. Thanks. Uh, and he sits down and is able to sort of navigate it and come up with some sketches and sort of, you know, That's walk awesome. to what I actually need. Uh, I have worked with a bunch of other artists. Um, some of them are notably harder to work with. And that's part of the process, you know. It's so coming to grips with the idea that you are not the only person who owns your project is important. You know, the narrators that I work with, well, they have to interpret it for their creativity. The cover artist is going to do something that you like, but they're going to do something they like too. And you have to allow people to have their own creative freedom if you want a, a really exciting finished product. That's my opinion. Yeah, you do definitely be careful with finding an editor. Uh, I, I've heard the recommendation, well, look in the front of somebody's book and often they put their editor in the acknowledgements as I do, but then make sure to read the book also and <laughs> You know, if you saw a whole lot of errors and things that made you raise your eyebrows, maybe keep looking. Yep. Most of my books still have typos. And some of my books have been through, you know, beta readers and then, you know, a content editor and then a proofreader and then a final check by me. And there's still typos. They're yeah. hard. <laughs> They're really it's, difficult to find. It is hard to catch all that. A lot of my earlier stuff does too. It's just in the last two or three years, I started having a typo hunter team that gets them before I publish them. And I've got a couple of really eagle eye folks on there that are awesome. I send them gift cards. <laughs> I'm like, thank you. <laughs> You're lucky. That's fantastic. Yeah. Um, so it sounds like you're already doing some marketing for this uh, new YA release. It, when does it come out? Is it April? A couple months March from now? March 26th. March. March. Okay. 
And you mentioned in, in your email that you had a Kirkus review for it, I think. How did you yeah. go about getting that? Yeah, I just booked it. You just pay for it. Um, it's arguably a gigantic waste of money. Um, I, I went and got one for one of my earlier books because I thought it was going to make me rich. Uh, it didn't. Uh, but I, I you know, allocated a, a chunk of funds to marketing this book. And one of the things I said was, well, I think this is pretty good. Uh, so I'm going to spring and I think it's 400 and something bucks for a Kirkus review. Uh, I'm going to spring for it. And if I get a starred review, uh, that's actually a pretty significant marketing coup. Uh, I didn't get a starred review, but I did get a favorable review. They said a lot of really nice things. They were not critical of anything in the book, um, which with Kirkus, I don't know if any of you have gotten a Kirkus review, but they're, they're typically pretty savage. Uh, they point out, every problem in the book and they talk about uh, what's good in typically unquotable ways uh, and you have to be creative when you're excerpting their reviews but they they gave me a review on the phone that was actually really really positive uh, which I'm very thankful for yeah that would be rough if uh, you spent that much money and <laughs> there was just nothing usable that you could uh, grab from it yep yeah. When you've yeah. used it in the past, do you like throw it on your Amazon page under the reviews or um, yeah. what, how, do, how can you take advantage, I guess, of having invested that chunk of money in that? Um, the plan is right now, uh, I'll put up some, some excerpts of the Kirkus Review on the editorial section on the, on the book itself on Amazon. Uh, in the Goodreads page, I'll have some you know, notes of that so when people see it on there, they'll be able to know that you know, a reputable literary place reviewed it and actually had good things to say. Uh, in addition, booking some of the, the first uh, email marketing blasts for when uh, I do some price promotions and price pulsing for it, I'll be able to talk to the you know, book bub, whatever, and, and quote the, the carcass review and give them a little bit more reason to let me book a major promotion so I can theoretically try and sell some more books that way. Uh, it'll be a series too, so like you know, any, any big promotion, the idea is to you know, give them book one on the cheap and get them hooked for books two plus. Um, they're not written yet, so we'll have to see how that goes. Um, and I'm not going to mark it too, too quickly with that. So, but that's the idea with the review to theoretically, um, use it as a springboard to gain a little bit more legitimacy at the beginning of a book's life. Cool. Um, all right. So related, but, uh, it looks like you're mostly, uh, Amazon exclusive Kindle Unlimited type stuff. Mm -hmm. Mostly, yeah. Uh, a lot of times, like when you talk about with BookBub and like that, with uh, with promotions being exclusive to Amazon can be a little bit of a of a handicap because they like to promote to places that all of their customers can get to. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, is is there a similar thing with getting like Kirkus? Obviously, you pay and they'll do it. Uh, but are they more reluctant to pick up a thing that's exclusive to Amazon? Kirkus. Yes. No, you pay, they review. Well, that's, <clears throat> that's a good system. Uh, do you ever pursue reviews from any other places and, and run into issues like that? I used to. Um, most of the time, if you're an indie, they don't take you seriously and they back burning you uh, or they charge you an exorbitant fee uh, because you're not with a major publishing house and uh, it's just not worth it. Um, you know, money is tight. I do not make a fortune. Uh, so I can't afford to spring for, you know, 500 bucks for every one of my book ones just to get a review that may or may not be positive that, you know, I have to wait six months to get. Um, so yeah, it's not something that I, I invest in regularly. It's a, it's all a game. All right. So, I mean, have you always planned on remaining exclusive with Amazon? Uh, I have a couple of books wide. Um, oh, good. That, I mean, uh, <laughs> I got to watch what I say. I, I've been dinged. <laughs> I mean, no comprendo. <laughs> I, have, yeah, I have, I think, three wide right now. Uh, two of them are underperforming wide, which is sort of is what it is. Uh, and then I have one that's wide that's actually performing better since I took it wide. Um, Out of curiosity, what caused you to release those titles wide? Uh, I had a pretty significant amount of my fans say, I would really like to read this on my Nook. Uh, and uh, I was going for a book bub. And the only way to really land a book bub right now is to, to be wide. So uh, have, you ever, have, you ever, have you ever considered taking any of your other titles and making them wide or are you just going to leave them where they are? I have. Uh, the, the big core horror series, I took the first three books wide uh, not too, too long after its release and saw uh, an almost 100% drop in revenue. 
um, as soon as I transitioned it back to Kindle Unlimited, the, the profits came back. Uh, so it just did not make sense to stay wide. So you've done a few different series and uh, different genres, and uh, you mentioned that you've made some mistakes with marketing over the years, which we all have. <laughs> Is there anything in specific that you've learned that uh, now going forward, you know, like this worked well for me, but this didn't work? <laughs> uh, I would say launch events um, have just become money sinks. Uh, you get the same 30 or 40 people attending them online. Uh, and I'm phenomenally thankful and grateful for those people. Uh, but you organize a lot of events, you organize a lot of prizes, you're eating a lot of you know, mailing fees if you're mailing out stuff. And I have yet to see a notable bump in sales as a result. Um, so I, I probably won't be doing many of those in the future. Uh, I, I think also um, I've used a lot of the email marketing ser services uh, during my price promotions, and some of them haven't given me any return at all. Um, you know, they'll do 30 or 40 free units for, you know, 40 or 50 bucks. And that's not, you know, not, not enough of a return. So. All right. Um, is there anything you intend to change kind of having learned what worked and what didn't work so well with your regular stuff uh, when you launched the pen name? Uh, with the pen name, it, it's a tremendous challenge because I can't do any trade on my name. Uh, I, I am telling my existing fans that I have a book coming out that's in a pen name, but you know, it's YA and they didn't start reading my books because I wrote YA. Uh, so the percentage of them that are going to give this book a shot is, you know, considerably lower than the number that would try, you know, a, a typical Chris Philbrook book. Uh, so I am trying to build a persona. I am trying to build, um, you know, personality of a new author that has a brand and an identity and his own theoretical marketing style. Um, so, you know, trying to invent a new person is a huge part of the process right now and trying to figure out what that person looks like. Not like physically, I'm not like sketching the guy or anything. <laughs> you are an 80 year old librarian from, uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know where. I do love role play. <laughs> Yeah, it, it seems like it would be a fun excuse too, but it's kind of hard when you actually have to send out newsletters and uh, m maintain a persona month in and, and month out. Yeah, yeah. I definitely am trying to do more uh, newsletter swaps with the YA uh, title. I'm trying to build up for release day right now, getting stuff organized, trying to promote other authors in the, in the genres. Um, with my previous stuff, I haven't really done a ton of newsletter swaps because those genres don't really have authors that have large newsletters. Um, so there hasn't really been a reason to, but with YA, it definitely seems to be, uh, huge. Uh, also Instagram, a lot of, uh, the target market for YA literature uses Instagram. They don't use Facebook. Uh, when you look at the, the number of people who use, um, you know, Facebook that are under the age of 20, say four, it drops off dramatically and all those numbers go straight over to Instagram. Uh, so if I want to try and sell books to people who uh, are that age, then I definitely need to learn how to use Instagram. And I'm a bit of a dinosaur. You know, I'm 40 plus now. Uh, so having to learn a whole new social media site is, you know, it's a job unto itself. So, are yeah. you worried? Oops. <laughs> are you worried at all about um, if you do announce it to your regular readers that you'll kind of mess up the also bots and algorithms on Amazon and such? Like, are you going to keep it silent for a few weeks and just try to do advertising and, and you mentioned the mailing list swaps? Um, I think, I don't think most of my fans are already aware. Um, I haven't had a, a large pre-order bump um, from that. So I don't think the also bots are going to get thrown off too, too much. Um, I'm really hopeful that the newsletter swaps that I have building up in, you know, through March will get me some, um, some of that good sort of association with titles. So we'll see. Um, all right. So uh, you talked about Instagram. We've had people on the show before who mentioned that particularly for young adult, Instagram is the way to go. Uh, from from that previous interview, we learned that uh, a lot of the times the target is not uh, ebooks but print when you're doing Instagram stuff because you know you're taking pictures. So like, how are you tackling the Instagram thing, and like, what are your plans in that regard? Uh, I'm drinking a lot. I, I, I bought a lot of beer, and um, <laughs> there's been some crying. Uh, thankfully, uh, my wife 
uh, is awesome. She has a tremendous eye uh, for photography and is really, really in touch uh, with how to sort of put together Instagram posts. She's been on Instagram for a while and she has sort of volunteered to help me uh, not look like a moron on Instagram. And I'm very thankful because the few posts that she's already helped me um, sort of put together and sort of test out have looked much, much better <laughs> than anything that I could have done myself. Uh, you are right, though, in that the majority of um, sort of marketing posts on Instagram are about pushing the print book. Uh, so we'll have to see. You know, as an indie, uh, primarily an indie, the vast majority of books you sell are either ebook or audio. Um, so transitioning to a business model where I'm trying to push print sales will be, you know, a challenge. But that's another part of the thing about doing YA that I have to focus on. And uh, are you looking to just sort of build a social media presence in that way? Or do you do you want to do advertising on Instagram as well? Both. Both. Um, I'm educating myself um, right now about that, um, you know, integrating through, you know, newsletters as well to make sure that the, you know, the posts are going to, to everything. Um, the pen name. Uh, we'll have an Instagram page and it'll be linked to, to that name's newsletter as well. So everything should theoretically cross pollinate. Um, and then, you know, Instagram's also about hashtags and finding out what those hashtags are that are going to put you in front of the people who are searching for the thing that you're putting out there. Uh, so theoretically, um, if I can do my legwork and my research and, and blanket the market and risk getting banned, uh, hopefully I'll get enough attention to get a few good reviews and, and theoretically snowball into a sustainable number of sales that'll let me write the rest of the series. Do you, is this your first pen name that you're creating or is it, are you have multiples out there already? Uh, numero uno. Numero uno. Have there been any surprises so far that you didn't realize that you'd have to deal with this because you're creating a pen name? Uh, it's just a lot of work. Uh, like I said, I can't trade on my name. Um, I don't have a website. For the pen name yet i don't have uh well I, I do have some of it now but i didn't have a facebook page i didn't have a twitter handle i didn't have a goodreads author page uh just all of the work that goes into creating an entire you know professional identity as an author has to be duplicated uh stuff that i did you know eight years ago uh i am now doing again and you know when was the last time i set up a goodreads author page well it was 2011. Um, so, you know, kind of reinventing the entire wheel for a second, you know, fictional author is, is a tremendous amount of work. It's very daunting. I, I do wish I had started it earlier. Um, and now it's sort of a rush to make sure everything is squared away by release day. I definitely feel for you. I did the pen name thing a few years ago, starting from scratch, not telling anyone and doing your own Goodreads page. <laughs> now it's, it's nice to be the point where people just fill in your stuff for you. You're like, wow, I didn't even you know, announce the release of that book and it's already up on Goodreads. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you to those out there that uh, are librarians on Goodreads and do that. Exactly. Um, we talked a little bit about the audiobooks already, but is there anything you're planning to do marketing wise uh, that you've learned works with your other ones for the release of the new pen name audiobook? Um, Audible and ACX offer every author uh, a certain amount of download codes for their audiobook releases. Uh, it's, you know, I think Audible Studios gives you something like 10 or 20, and then ACX gives you, I think, 25. Uh, those Audible download codes are essentially gift codes, and the idea is you give them to people to download your audiobook, listen to it, and then write your review. Uh, so when the book releases pretty quickly, you can amass. A, uh, a chunk of uh, relatively legitimate reviews. Uh, previously, I, you know, the first probably four or five books that I put out, I, I just gave the codes out to people who I wanted to listen to the book. I didn't ask for anything in return. Uh, I think I'll be a lot more uh, planful using those codes, um, making sure that the people who get them are actually going to be uh, giving me something back for them. Uh, and, and building a, an actual base of reviews. Uh, I couldn't tell you how many I've given away with all the audiobooks I've done, and I guarantee you my rate of return for codes given out versus reviews re received uh, is, you know, 10% perhaps. Uh, so making sure that I'm being more um, 
planful with uh, who gets those codes and, and assuring that I'm going to get something back for them, um, I think is going to be big and helpful rather than just giving away a free book for nothing when I have the ability to be choosy as, you know, as opposed to like an email where I'm just giving away a thousand books for free. Now, I, I know specifically that those codes can be redeemed for any book because I use them as rewards for my Patreon people. <laughs> and I'm like, here, use it for this book. I just, I linked to my books that I just published, but like the series I'm doing now wasn't even qualified for codes because it's not exclusive to Audible. Don't tell them that. So I've been using old ones that I never used from books that were exclusive and could get the codes. Um, is there anything you're doing to kind of ensure that they actually, I mean, I include a link to the book I want them to use the code on. <laughs> so I guess that's common sense and uh, like instructions on how to redeem it. Is there anything specific you do to try to make sure they're <laughs> getting the right book and, you know, you can only do so much to get them to review, I guess. Uh, have a relationship with the person. Um, I'm really big on building a relationship with my readers. Um, I know a lot of them by name. And uh, I, I follow the thousand true fans theory. I don't know if you guys are <clears throat> aware of it or familiar with it, but I, I have kind of followed that since day one and it's been a slow process, but a successful one. Um, and I, I now have, um, you know, a fan club that's got three or 400 people that, you know, I've known for five years that I, I see post on a daily basis. And I know out of that, you know, 300 people, there are probably 30 or 40 that, when they say they're going to do something, they're the kind of people who are going to do it. Um, and now that I have that sort of that, you know, inner echelon of people who are so supportive and so amazing for me, um, I, I can reward them. I can give them the free book and not feel bad um, that, you know, uh, I'm losing a sale and I, I feel good that they're getting something for free because they've done so much work for me. You know, they've done, they've done the reviews, they've bought all the stuff, they have the ebook and the, the print version and the audio book and you know, they're, they're those kinds of people. So giving them a free book, uh, yeah, I'm absolutely overjoyed to at this point. Now, uh, uh, you talk, you have a good relationship with your fans, it sounds like, uh, and that's sort of the only way that you can get this sort of information. So I'm curious about it. Uh, do you find there are certain groups of your, of your, of your readers slash listeners, depending on what they do that are dedicated to that? Like do people who listen to audiobooks only listen to audiobooks and act as essentially a separate, uh, uh, uh market than, than mm -hmm. ebook readers? Like how do you, what's your feeling on that? Uh, I do think that there's a significant divide. I would say right now I'm doing about 40% audiobooks out of my total sales numbers. And of the people who do audio, they're like 90% audio only. Um, and then that, the small segment that, that, you know, double dips are people who got the ebook on a 99 cent special and then get the audio book for a buck 99. So they're, you know, value shopping. Um, which I have no problem with. I'm happy that they're, you know, they're able to game the system and I still get the sale and some revenue. Um, there are a few people who do the whisper sync thing where they, you know, read the audio book and then get in the car or they read the ebook and then get in the car and listen to the audio book. Um, but for the most part, the, the, the division is pretty, pretty notable, at least in my, my reader base. You, do you feel that complicates marketing or do you feel like that, uh, uh, are there any marketing methods that sort of cast a wide enough net to reach both of those markets? Uh, Facebook, um, AMS ads are the only, you know, real ways that I've been able to reach everybody. Uh, one thing that is very difficult is newsletters. Um, you kind of have to divide your newsletter up into segments, uh, based on people who listen to the audiobooks and then writing an audiobook only newsletter, um, versus people who do print and ebook. I, I have some titles that are ebook only. Um, they will never see print. They will never be made into audio because they're just not long enough. And, you know, narrators aren't interested. And, you know, Audible doesn't want to put out a, an audiobook that's 15 minutes long kind of a thing. Um, but they are in series that are big in audio. So getting the audio fans to spend 99 cents on a short novella is almost impossible. Uh, and trying to find a way to bridge that gap would be fantastic. But we'll see. All right. So my final question for you would be is, should all authors consider releasing their titles as audiobooks? If a first time author approaches you and asks whether or not it's worth it to create one, what would you tell them? Uh, based on my lived experience, absolutely. Uh, it is a different undertaking than putting out an ebook and a print book. You have to understand what you're getting into. You need to do the research. You, you really, really need to do the 
research. Um, but it can be very lucrative. Um, you know, like I said, I, I think I'm doing 40% audiobooks right now. And, um, you know, if it wasn't for those audiobooks, I'd still be working a job um, and trying to write at night and on the weekends. Uh, so for me, it, audio is a must. I, I don't write a book really without having some kind of a plan for what audio is going to look like. And sometimes that plan is we're not going to do audio, but for the most part, everything is going to audio. Yeah, I just started doing audio within the last uh, year or two, and I, I slapped my hands. I waited so long because it's doing quite well for me. Good for you. Does the length of the book uh, tie into whether you're going to do audio? or Because, you know, we've talked about before on the show how people like to get a good deal for their credit, and the longer the book, obviously, the more expensive it is. Yep, yep. Um, I write the book based on the length that it really needs to be. Uh, I don't worry about whether or not it's a good value for credit. Um, the good thing is, is almost all of my books wind up being a good value for a credit. Um, I do have a bunch of novellas on Audible um, that aren't worth a credit. Uh, they're, you know, I think Audible charges five ninety nine for them or something like that. Um, and those don't sell anywhere near the clip um, that the, the credit titles do. But they still sell, you know, 50, 60, 70, you know, units a month. And that adds up. So, um, but I, I try and write for the value of the story, not the value of a credit. Right. I was just thinking if that would be a consideration if people are thinking, should I invest $2,500 or whatever in producing it myself? And if it's only going to be like a seven hour audio book, that might be a challenge to a uh, harder to entice people and break even on, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the kind of thing that you would, I would think that you would wonder about royalty share on, you know, because a shorter book, you're probably not going to move tremendous amounts of units at full price. Um, so a royalty share may make more sense. And, uh, you know, a narrator might be more willing to do that, you know, because they're not going to get paid that much money on a short book uh, anyway. So it's not much of a risk to take a royalty share on it. But every narrator is different. It depends on the relationship you have with your creator. All right. Well, that's about the end of our questions. Is there any final advice you'd like to offer for uh, maybe authors with uh, just getting started now or a couple books out and hoping to sell more? Stay patient. Um, keep writing. Build a body of work. Um, advertising is notably more powerful when you have more things people can buy. Um, the vast majority of people don't sell enough of any one title um, to become an author, you know, a full-time self-employed author. Uh, so stick with it, build a body of work, stay patient with it, um, write what you enjoy. Don't necessarily try to write to market. I know there's a lot of advice that says write to market and that's great. But if you don't love the story you're writing, it doesn't matter whether or not you're writing in a good market or a bad market. It's just going to be a bad story. Um, and I know that when I have tried to sort of wiggle my way into markets that weren't my favorite, I, I struggled and it showed and the stuff wasn't as good as it could have been. So stay patient, stay focused. It's the long game. This is not a, a sprint. It's a marathon for sure. All right. Good advice. And thank you for joining us tonight. Can you remind folks the names of uh, the, new, the pen name and the new book and uh, anything else you want to plug before we go? Uh, the, the big stuff is under my name. You could just type in Chris Philbrick on you know, Google or Amazon and find everything that I've written. Uh, and then the pen name is WJ Orion. Uh, and the, the series that he is writing uh, is called The Dry Earth. And book one is called The Phone. And that's coming out March 26th. All right. Well, thank you for joining us. And for anybody that wants to check out your stuff and didn't get the links, it'll be in the show notes over at marketingsff.com. As usual, episode 219. Thank you for joining us, Chris. And thank you for listening, everyone. Thank you so much. Nice to meet you, Chris. Thanks for hanging out with us. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate it. So long, everybody.